Welcome to Season 8, Episode 29 of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Tuesday the 22nd of September and we're going to be discussing what's been happening in the news. I'm Martin and joining me this week are Laura. Hello. Hello. Alan. Hiya. <laughs> and Mark. Hello. Is everyone well? Yes. I think so. Good. Well, should we not just sit here waffling whilst I grapple for words? Should we just get on with it? (laughs) Yes, let's. And now it's time for some news. It's the year of the Linux desktop for Dell in China. Dell's head of China told the Wall Street Journal that Neo Kylin Linux is shipped on 42% of the PCs it sells into China. Tech in Asia claims that Neo Kylin was based on Ubuntu Kylin, which was developed for the Chinese by Canonical. Actually, it's pronounced Chilin. Cool. But, oh, you know, I, I shouldn't <clears> pick <throat> up on that. The fact that, you know, 42% of their machines ship with it is the headline there, not the fact that, that you mispronounced cool. it. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Probably the largest growing PC market in the world. Mm. Yeah. So because Windows XP has gone out of service, they're looking around for what to replace it with and not apparently don't fancy Windows 10. So um yeah, they're going the Ubuntu route and Dell is a big player in China it seems. Yeah, and it's not just China actually. I uh was at a thing mm. last year or earlier this year. And uh, there were some execs from Dell there, and they said that they're shipping very high volumes, like similar numbers to that in European countries as well. So it's it's yeah, right. it's not just China. I mean, they didn't say anything officially on the record, but they certainly said to me there were significant numbers of machines shipping in certain European countries that have uh, Ubuntu pre-installed rather than rather than Windows. And it it kind of amazes me how, given they kind of make it quite hard for you to buy them <laughs> you know it's not like you can mm. easily yeah. get them you know it's not like system 76 or yeah. or you know entroware or any of the other like ubuntu specific vendors who make it very easy to see their ubuntu lineup they yeah. don't actually make it that easy they make it hard for us to buy them but we don't speak chinese or yeah insert well, Eastern sure. european language and- here yeah, but also in China yeah. and India, there are actually shops, you know, yeah. where you can walk in and buy one, you know, with it pre-installed. Sure. Um, yeah, um, the what, and this says that it's forty-two percent of Dell's PCs that are sold into China. But I read in one of the articles that forty percent of PCs in China are from Dell. I think is that right? So is that forty percent of forty percent? The forty percent total PC market in China, which is still yeah, a significant so. number, isn't still, it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And HP are also shipping Neo Kylin on their PCs as well in China, but they haven't released any sales figures. Interesting. Mm. Mm. Mark. Let's Encrypt are working towards general availability over the next couple of months and passed a major milestone by issuing its first certificate. Let's Encrypt yeah. Let's Encrypt certificates will work just about anywhere. They've submitted initial applications to the root programs for Mozilla, Google, Microsoft and Apple already. So remind us what Let's Encrypt is. So this is an initiative to make it really, really easy to get free uh, SSL certificates so that you can encrypt all of the websites, basically. It's not currently super easy to get a free SSL certificate. I mean, you could probably get one, but it's not a wild card. It'll be just for one host, right? Yes. So, yeah, there's um, there's a few ways of getting free ones. There's companies like Start mm. SSL who do you a one-year certificate with... Um, a sort of basic level of verification. I also discovered another one recently called um, CA Cert, uh, which is um, mm. a sort of uh, a community-based web of trust certificate authority. Oh, that's been around for years. Yeah. We've we've talked yeah. about that on the show years and years and years ago. I used I used to use CA Cert back in the day, but they're not in all of the um, root this programs is the trouble. anymore. So in fact, yeah. talking to talking to some people um, who are involved, in fact, there isn't really any um sort of formal way of getting approval as a, a root ca and therefore being included in all the browsers it's just kind of knowing the right people unfortunately however yeah. let's encrypt have a lot of the right people involved and have the backing of people like the linux foundation so hopefully they're going to be a bit more successful uh, um, at getting it in all the browsers by default and therefore will be trusted and um, another way that you can get a um, free 
in air quotes um, certificate is to use Cloudflare. Uh, even with their free package, if you use Cloudflare, you can tick a box to enable SSL and they'll generate you uh, a wildcard certificate for your domain and then uh, reverse proxy all of the stuff through them and do the SSL termination at their end. And then you can just use a self-signed certificate um, between Cloudflare and yourself. So it is wow. possible to do it for free with Cloudflare. And that means you could move to a different host and, you know, do yeah. any kind of DNS changes you want to, so long as you're using Cloudflare in front, the front. of. Yeah. Oh wow! Exactly. That. That's interesting. Yeah. I got obviously there's the the downside that you've got a self sign cert on your site, so people aren't going directly to your site, so they they people can no. mistrust Cloudflare, for example. Yeah, um, and I mean, you can e- you can even have the connection between Cloudflare and your site just just over HTTP as well, um, or you can even you know put a proper cert on your site and have a fully trusted connection between yourself and Cloudflare. So you know you can use Cloudflare to to do it for free uh, in in a sense. But I'm I'm super excited about Let's Encrypt. I'm really looking forward to this um, coming along. So do you think this is like the beginning of the end of um, HTTP without the S? If, if, if Let's Encrypt takes off and it's possible for any mom and pop, uh, you know, hosting provider to enable SSL on all of their customer sites, why would you not? So, you yeah, know, why would you bother having HTTP? I, it remains to be seen because I've looked through the code. They've got a GitHub repository where they've been working on the code to do this and they're trying to make it as simple as you can just say Let's Encrypt and, site name and it generates you the necessary certificates but that still requires that you have the software on your machine and that you're at the command line and you're running these things so i don't know if there's a planned initiative to put a fancy web ui on this so you can just do it all through the web and it's very simple and what have you but right, you know, but potentially your web server still could do that your web server still needs configuring but yes you're you're quite right that yeah um, it could be integrated to cpanel or something you know yeah yeah your hosting if there's apis uses. and stuff yeah so but i think it's the start of the beginning of the end i don't think this is the end of the end until of course the uk government make it illegal uh well of course yes <laughs> i mean yeah it's always a possibility moving on martin uh, Volkswagen shares have plunged more than 18% after US regulators found out that some of the cars could manipulate official emissions tests. Um, and this is due to some DRM on their software? So, so the D- Digital Millennium Copyright Act says it's a felony to tamper with the DRM. The Copyright Office um, apparently offered up the possibility to create exceptions to this rule so people could check the software and you could you could um, basically route your car. Um, but the car manufacturers obviously said, no, you shouldn't do that. And the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, um, also said you shouldn't do that. And their concern was that people, car owners would um, hack their cars and make them do things that would increase their emissions. So also the software of DRM is all protected, so nobody can look at the code. And EPA is now accusing Volkswagen of having used that cover-up to actually increase emissions. I think up to, what's it, up to 40 times? Yeah, up to 40 times in diesel cars, potentially. Um Above the huh. legal so, so this limit. means what when it's being tested, it detects it's being tested and suddenly stops emitting yep. whatever it's not supposed to be emitting, and then when it's driving is normally, this, it does. Is this the automotive yeah. equivalent of when your Android phone runs a benchmarking application, yes. it overclocks yes. all the GPUs? It's exactly. <laughs> yes. the same. It's exactly. Isn't the same. this? Isn't this just the most delicious reason to explain why DRM is bad to exactly. uh, normals? Yeah, uh, but, uh, you know, to be fair, this is one company that's been found to a very large international company that have been told to um, adhere to certain, like, emission regulations in a particular country in America, right? And mm-hmm. in order to adhere to those regulations, which are more strict than they are over here, they've had to, you know, jump through some hoops to do that and arguably you could say well if they've had to do it and all the other car manufacturers including the american car manufacturers and all the other europeans and the asian car manufacturers they've all had to get their emissions down as well i cannot believe that it's only volkswagen that are doing this 
I, I, I yeah. refuse to believe they're the only mm. company doing mm. this. I would imagine that this is the scratching the surface and other companies, we're going to find out they're, they're all doing this kind of thing, not necessarily for emissions. I mean, that's the most important one, but there might be other things that they do to manipulate their miles per gallon or something else. Cause they, they all manipulate in other ways. It's when they're doing, when they're being tested for miles per gallon, they take out the radio and they take out the spare wheel to make the yes. weight lighter. Oh, yeah. And they, they do it on a rolling road rather than a real road. And- right. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> You know, I, I feel bad for Vo- Volkswagen because they're the first ones found to do it. I feel less bad because, because they, they did should it. open source because they did it. But then, <laughs> you know, it's bad that their share price drops you know, so badly. I would expect they're all going to do it and then it'll all market will correct itself because they'll all say, well, everyone was doing it. So, mm. you know, which yeah. is bad, but. You know, I feel bad. There's, um, there's an open data initiative somewhere in here, isn't there? There is. There's a there's a um, EC, um, ECUs for cars. You know, for open source ECUs for cars. That you know, project that yeah. someone needs to chuck on Indiegogo. I suspect. And this this kind of comes on the back of the thing that we talked about the other week about um, was it Toyota who, when they actually looked at their code, found mm. all kinds of problems with it. Um, so it, there, there seems to be a general software in cars is an open source problem at the moment well i think it's the same with any proprietary software isn't it there's there's holes in it that you don't Mm -hmm. know and you don't know are there because nobody can look at it and nobody can investigate it and poke at it with a stick and yeah but there are people who do like you know those guys who um in america managed to control a car remotely because via a sequence of events they got through some you know wireless uh, 3g connection to the car and then jumped from one system to another and managed to control the car and it's it, you know people poking at it will will find these holes but you know proprietary vendors are all cutting corners in some way or another i refuse to accept that you know again that all these companies are making perfect code all the time um, mm-hmm. And this is an anomaly. They're, they're all doing it. It's, it's a symptom of proprietary software in a way. I think the interesting thing is that because it's cars, it's hitting the mainstream media. Right. And I mean, because people don't see a these... car as a computer either. Exactly. And more cars have been controlled by software all the time plus there's the uh you know the fact that it's in california as well is the you know is the hippie part of america where emissions from cars is like a massive no-no you know Mm. anyway moving on um ibm are releasing an open source blockchain theme laura what is this all about something to do with bitcoin well it's kind of the technology that underlies bitcoin um yeah mark you read about it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Do you understand it? Well, I read um, the there's, there's an article about um, about Imogen Heap, who's a musician, talking about ways for mm-hmm. um, independent artists to use this technology to uh, to distribute their works, basically. And I think that what she's saying, or what, what the idea that her and the other people who she's working with are saying, um, is that you could use this as a way of distributing a copy of, um, of your work on your you know, an artist's independent website and because of the way that blockchain works it creates um, a, a sort of open independently verified record of every transaction which means that um, partly you can you as an artist can ensure that you know who's getting copies of your work and the other way around um, the person who's got a copy of your work can very easily see who the rights belong to and therefore make sure that um, royalties are getting paid the right way which is um, better for artists than some of the other deals that they're being offered at the moment um, but essentially yeah it's a way of um, in the same way that bitcoin the whole network of bitcoin can see how much money went to who and when um, who being um, a sort of anonymized hash in the case a of bitcoin yeah. a, a bitcoin wallet mm-hmm. um, but yeah so yeah that, that's basically that the idea is that it's a system to to um have making yeah, have a dis- yeah, have a distributed it? record of transactions between nodes on a network and ibm's releasing an open source version implementation i of think this, yeah I think. an open source implementation of the technology yeah oh interesting yeah and Italy's Ministry of Defence have dropped Microsoft Office in favour of LibreOffice and have adopted the open document format ODF. Cool. Mm. Yep. So this is yet another, another one public of us. body. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, we we hear a lot about Munich and that's often held up as sort of the shining example of, you know, a big municipality that's moved. Yeah. And there have been smaller stories of the French gendarmerie. There was another another small town in Germany and various others. And it's good to just highlight these as they crop up. And in particular, I like this because it's not we're moving everything to an open source platform. We're just changing the office suite. And I think this is great because if you start with the office suite, that's usually the biggest hurdle on on the desktop. And um, if you can overcome that, then swapping out the underlying operating system at a later date is um, less of a challenge and facilitates migration. So um, I think this is great. Yeah. And it's the responsible thing to do for a government as well. Why would you want all of your, especially um, the military, why would you want all of your data locked up in um, proprietary, um, patent-encumbered mm. yeah. data formats? And it's been- there, was a, there was a recent thing in the UK with, uh, I think it was a museum had uh, documents in an old Microsoft format and everyone was you know, saying, well, what we should do is extract all the data and put them into another format. And I think they eventually decided in the end to use Microsoft Virtual Machines <laughs> running the old software wow. to be able to open those files rather than convert wow. them into something new. Yeah, the consulting partner in that case was Microsoft <gasps> solving the problem. Shock. Mm. By, yeah, yeah, fancy that. <laughs> Hey-ho. Mark, Debian news. Finally, it was decided at this year's DebConf to stop producing new CD ISOs for, ver- uh, for future Debian updates onward. For Debian testing and Debian 9.0 stretch and all future releases, the Debian project will stop making CD sets for new builds, but they'll continue spinning CDs for existing releases like Wheezy and Jesse. And I So what will they do instead? They'll make net install images uh, and, and DVDs. DVDs. Yes. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, so it's just getting rid of it's the just, smaller media. Exactly. In the yeah, same, I mean, Ubuntu yeah. did so the same getting rid of that longer, eight they? CD right. set. Yeah. yeah. I thought I thought yeah about time too. Who who uses CDs anymore? And then um, yesterday <laughs> I had to blow the dust off my blank CDs and burn a CD to install an old machine. Yeah. But I think oh, if you are goodness. limited to CDs, the idea is that you can use the net installer, which will fit on a CD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I ended up using the um, plop bootloader and uh, then using a USB stick because <laughs> it was an old machine that didn't boot off USB. You must tell us you more about uh, plop another time. Oh. Plop is fantastic. <laughs> and now it's time for the community news and events. Uh, first up, uh, we've got we've got a bunch here. So the first one is a big bug bonanza. Ubuntu 16.04 LTS has been announced by Will Cook on his blog. Uh, he's, he writes, over the years, the bug lists for Unity 7 and Compis have grown to become unmanageable. To make sure we're focusing on the most important issues, we have some serious tidying up of the bug lists and we need some help. And he writes up the whole process, uh, that the team and anyone else wanting to get involved can go through in order to verify that bugs still exist or whether they're no longer affect, um, Unity 7 and Compis and can be marked as, you know, no longer valid so they can focus on the next the next six months working on the ones that are the most important most affecting users and so on cool yeah this is a good initiative the the only question i've got is isn't shouldn't is there or should there be a, a an ubuntu endorsed place for these kinds of announcements there is it's called the fridge yeah (laughs) Uh, okay so it's gone in there so it's linked in there as well okay right Uh, i assume so uh well fridge.com oh was it okay yeah uh yeah it's 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 tricky because uh you know people write their own blog posts and then uh, and there's also the ubuntu weekly news um which is another place to to get it but um yeah it is a valid thing honest oh oh, no i i realize that and there's uh the Ubuntu Council Call for Nominations, it's Community Council Call for Nominations, all seven elected Community Council member terms expire in November of this year. So if you like being shouted at and dealing with, <laughs> dealing with difficult controversies, you too can apply for the Community Council. So tell us how the Community Council works and why they're expiring. Uh, so the Community Council is... Um, the top level um, in the Ubuntu 
like a uh, community structure and they delegate um, some responsibility to other teams um, and it consists of members of the community and Mark. Mark has a permanent position on the CC. Mark Shuttleworth, and- not me. Mark, yes, Mark. <laughs> Sorry, he said, thanks for clarifying that in case anyone was I think confused. we got that. <laughs> um, the other people are um, nominated. Uh, so uh, anyone who is an Ubuntu member can be nominated to be on the community council. And then um, the current CC go through that list and then create a vote. And then all Ubuntu members can vote for who goes on the CC. And those people on the CC uh deal with like issues that we've discussed in previous episodes um uh they also deal with conflict resolution and they also um interact quite closely with canonical when community members need them to hmm. uh, i did this for 2 years about three years ago, I stopped. Uh, four, oh, yeah, nearly four years ago, I stopped being on the community council. It is good fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I would recommend if someone else is in the Ubuntu community and is a, an Ubuntu member, I would recommend uh, put yourself forward uh, if you have some time to work on these things and help make Ubuntu better. Cool. Cool. On the um, Ubuntu quality mailing list, there's a topic being started discussing uh, the idea of replacing the startup disk creator. The Has anyone USB been following this? Thing. That's the US thing that creates USB sticks? Some That's the one. Oh, what's there? Why is it... Oh, okay. <laughs> why, is it be... why is it being potentially replaced? it never, ever works. Well, ever. I... Th- yeah. It works for I... me if you're on the right version and you install in the right version. This is really what the conversation was all about. I think it was started by a community member basically saying this is broadly unreliable. Should it be replaced with something else? And then the conversation has snowballed into discussing every conceivable other option and some very detailed analysis on what the, of all of the bugs that are logged, what the sort of handful that they all distill down into our so actually the there's thousands of bugs or hundreds of bugs and it's impossible to fix has now been identified this sort of three critical <laughs> bugs that actually need resolving and that it isn't this you know um impossible um yeah. hurdle to clear so um i think the I, I don't think there's been a decision as such but i think the 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 travel of direction is um or the direction of travel even is that um they're going to fix fix the 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 bugs and keep it (laughs) which seems obvious really (laughs) Mm. yes but it was a useful conversation because it's actually it's actually identified what needs fixing it's good it's only code so if anyone it's written in python isn't it the uh startup it is yeah right so if anyone's uh been doing a bit of python recently and uh you know wants a project to get them to get their teeth stuck into then uh, startup disk creator will be a great one because it's mm. it's a really useful it's quite a small tool it doesn't have a huge scope you know copying stuff onto a usb key um you know there's a there's a little bit of intricacy to it in the way that it does it and the way that it it has certain modes like persistence mode so you can make a usb key that you can yeah. keep data on that kind of stuff is quite the, interesting but tricky the python itself is easy to understand the only thing you may need to learn or bring with you is some understanding about how disk partitioning and efi and things like that work so you might just need to go and do a little bit of research on that but the python itself is quite straightforward Mm -hmm. and and the the list has already you know identified the main areas that need working on so it really just needs you know people to step up and actually just fix them that's that's basically it it's simply a matter of coding The Ubuntu developers have uh, discussed the future of Snappy Personal, Unity 8, Mir, and Convergence. Is that on a video? It's a YouTube link, so I assume so, yes. Yeah, I'm hoping. Uh, What was this then? I've no idea. Ubuntu Team Community Q&A. Oh, that's me. (laughs) So you were probably... So, Alan. No, I wasn't on it that week. (laughs) So it was... um, the community Q&A we do uh, every week. We try and get guests on uh, to answer questions from the community and talk a bit about what they're, what they're up to and, uh, you know, so that people have a better idea. Because, you know, it of, it's often seen that, you know, stuff happens, you know, in Canonical and we're working really hard and then suddenly a video pops out and it's like, oh, that works. Uh, or, the, you know, oh, they're doing it that way or something. And uh, we want to try and make it easier for people to get 
their questions answered. And this was one of those Q&A sessions with um, a guy called Kevin Gunn, who works a lot on Unity 8 and Mir and all the new stuff that's you know shiny and interesting. Cool. The Ubu contest, which we spoke about maybe about four episodes ago, I guess, um, has had 25 app and scope entries, out of which 22 are qualified for the contest. And this is um, a contest to encourage people to write apps or scopes um, for the Ubuntu phone or Ubuntu mobile. Awesome. Um, The judging panel, including me, will be judging the entries over the next couple of weeks. But in the meantime, if you fancy taking a look, we'll put a link in the show notes and you can have a look and let us know what you think of some of the apps. It won't, It's just for fun. Um, you'll have no influence, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to, are um, you trying to crowdsource your judging responsibility, <laughs> get other people to do the judging, and then you can say, yeah, you've got no influence at all. Yeah, I really think I, I agree with that, yeah. I am a fan fan of crowdsourcing things like this. Um, at Ubuntu Podcast on Twitter, if you want to tweet us, or show at UbuntuPodcast.org if you want to email us. Or Laura at Laura <laughs> <laughs> PayPal too. Yeah. Awesome. So the, the list um, of submitted entries is, is listed on the website, and you can, yeah. can, you, can you download them, or are there links to the store and all that kind of stuff where people can install them on their phone? I believe so. I right. haven't yes. tried it there yet. Are, there's a link to UAP Explorer for each one, which is the Excellent. cool third-party yep. website for mm-hmm. Ubuntu apps. Cool. And finally, we have an event. Well, two events. <laughs> um, What's the first <clears throat> event, Laura? The first one is DevRelCon, which is in London on the 30th of September, which is a week uh, yesterday, if you're listening to this. Um, so yeah, thirtieth wow, of September a week, in London. A week yesterday, if you're listening to this on the specific day where it is, a week on the, yesterday. Yeah, yes. exactly. So thirtieth of September. That's next Wednesday, basically, from when we're recording. Um, and yes, it's Matt Ravel who we've had interviewed on the show at various points. Um, he's uh, organised it, and it's a one-day event in London, and I think it's ninety-nine pounds for a ticket. And I'm speaking, and Alan's going. Mm, I am. I believe. Yes, I am. I'm attending. Um, Yes, um, and I th- there'll be lots of community types there. And it's, it's a, a single track, isn't it? It's it's a single track, yeah. all presentation talks, not no exhibition yeah. space or anything like that. It's just one nope. track, one day. Awesome. Yeah. Looking forward to it. For developer relations people. Cool. Uh, and the other event is... Oh, camp. Hooray! Yay! Which is on um, the 31st Halloween weekend, 31st yes. of October. I've got um, my costume yep. ready. <laughs> Oh, oh, you're wearing that my. again, are you? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we'll uh, speak to Les Pounder, who's one of the main organisers of OGCAMP uh, next time. We'll chat to him about yes. uh, what goes on at OGCAMP. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Is that all the news and events? I believe it is. I think that's all the news and events. We love getting your feedback, so please send it to us. Even the pointlessly mean stuff makes us laugh a little bit. If it's short, tweet us on at Ubuntu Podcast. If it's less short, but please no essays, email us on show at ubuntupodcast.org. Or you can leave a comment on the relevant show notes on our website, ubuntupodcast.org. And that's all for episode 29. We'll be back next week when we'll be discussing OGCAMP 2015 with Les Pounder and we'll be bringing you some command line love. Excellent. Awesome. Um, I think we've been getting more feedback since we've put uh, Laura's um, call for feedback in there. Yeah. Don't you? I think so too, but I wasn't going to mention it. (laughs) It's almost (laughs) like marketing works, isn't it? (gasps) Right. Yes. Awesome. Uh, So, yeah, we'll see you next time with uh, discussion with Les and uh, send us your feedback, whether you heard Laura's thing or not. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Right, let's knock it on the head then.